Hello and uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, uh, today we'll be talking about uh, Web3 gaming, what it is and why it matters. And uh, I guess a bit of uh, a background on, on me. I think it's better for us to kind of start before talking about what it is and why it matters is who I am and what I'll be talking about. So my name is Paul. I'm currently the CTO and co-founder of OP Games, which is a, a company which, which tries to help game developers find more success in Web3. And uh, what that means is we want to be able to help game developers find more sustainable business models because uh, us ourselves have been game developers. We've seen the challenges of making games uh, both in Web2 and Web3. And we, we, we now have the tools to kind of uh, find new economic systems to create these new kinds of games. So, uh, so we're really looking forward to this talk and also telling everyone about the things that we're doing. Um, so the gist of the talk, um, I'll start with what Web2 is, sort of as a reference point for all of us. And then the majority will be around what, what Web3 is and why we should be building on it. And then the last part would be how we get started in making Web3 games. And yeah, so uh, and other one, one other thing to mention is I'm also part of the Kernel Gaming Guild, which is a group of uh, Web3 fellows who explore what it means to build here in Web3. So just something to take a look at as well. Uh, so I have my Twitter profile up there and just uh, just follow the links. Cool. Uh, and yeah, and so I guess I wanted to start with what Web2 is. and um, And I come at it from a background of a uh, game developer. Web2 started out right around the time of, I would say around the early 2000s to, to currently what we have now. It's, it's mostly been about uh, um, the, the, what has been enabled by the newer, uh, richer web pages that we now have, now have. Like Web2 was like the static web pages, HTML, and then Web2 came about and it was brought about by all of these new modern web technologies. And I, I would say also that uh, like there are three kind of major technologies that also are important during this movement. And these were social, uh, which is uh, exemplified by Facebook, all of these social networks. Uh, mobile, uh, which is, uh, of course, the devices that we all now use to browse the web, and then advertising. So I, I would say these three technologies and movements, they, they decentralized and kind of democratized game development at the start. Um, we, we've seen a lot of uh, great games uh, start out because of these. A lot of the games we play now were, were born out of the technologies that Web2 has provided. But as we kind of uh, go into a more mature space, uh, a more technology cycle, uh, we've kind of seen power centralized around these Web2 web uh, web to companies. So we, we hear a lot about the FAMGA, right? The Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon. So uh, in, in the current Web2 system, a, a lot of uh, value has centralized around the attention economy. And what that means is uh, it's, it's mostly these big companies who are able to determine which games succeed. Uh, a lot of the times that the, the best games that succeed are mostly the ones that have the the capability to, to buy a lot of ads, who are able to get into the app stores to be discovered and to and and to really just know how to play the game, honestly. So if, if I share these two these two charts. Um, and one thing worth noting is the games that have been the top on in the app stores have mostly been the same games since uh, I would say more than five years. So that that power dynamic hasn't really changed. And that's largely born out of the, the current uh, attention economy, wherein the, 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 these big companies are, I would say, the kingmakers in the space, which leads us to Web3. Uh, I, I would say that uh, like similar to Web2 at that time, right? Web2 wasn't really defined. We kind of see it now in hindsight. But And Web3 is in the same space. Uh, Web3 is being pu pulled and pulled pushed and pulled in, in every direction, I would say. It's being put into the same buckets of nebulous terms such as the metaverse. Uh, so it's kind of tough to talk about it. But I think one thing that we can do to kind of uh, simplify it a bit for now is uh, when you think of a Web3 app and thinking of a web, think of making a Web3 game, uh, an, an analogy is uh, just uh, in Web2, a lot of the uh, initial entry points was the social network accounts or the accounts that we use to log into to the app. So we have log in with Facebook, uh, with Google, all of these other uh, buttons that allow you to, to get your identity tied to the game. In Web3 though, well, the, the main thing for to be able to associate these accounts is the Web3 wallet. 
and what the Web3 wallet is essentially is it's a, it's actually just a private key and the public address. So a private key is a, is a mnemonic, a 12 word mnemonic, which uh, similar to these ones, which the as long as you know that this mnemonic, you have control of your account and tied to that private key is a public address. So anyone who knows your public address is able to interact with your account. And uh, most of the time, the, the the transactions are done via wallets and signatures. So something very different here is, uh, of course, uh, we don't need a centralized server now to be able to have access of our accounts. We only need this private key, which is uh, which is very different. We, we don't need to be able to, for example, go to Facebook or go to Amazon or Google to be able to, to build a service. And this is very important because uh, this decentralizes identity and currently, identity is is how Web two platforms actually cons consolidate power and extract value from from the current uh, services that are out there. So imagine your your journey as a game developer uh, for for each step of making a game from creation to distribution, discoverability, and monetization. Most of the time, you'll have to go through a, a Web two centralized platform from creation to distribution. You'll need a server from Amazon. Discoverability. You'll have to go through the app stores. You'll to find the you need to go through an ad network and to monetize you have to go through the app stores again so at every step of the process it's always been an extractive process uh, for game developers and that kind of uh, has defined the kind of games that we're making and 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 that's really what's important about web3 so we kind of start with the wallet as the initial entry point but it's a very very big uh, very deep rabbit hole i would say uh, it starts with wallets and what that means for decentralized identities so we don't need to to rely on these web2 platforms anymore for for monetization uh, and for identity and that that the idea of decentralization actually goes through a lot in in the technologies that we use in web3 so uh, for when for example with the wallets that we have now it doesn't really we, we use some of these wallets like a metamask argent and wallet connect to to be able to access our wallets but these are mostly uh, UX uh, UX tools, and the, the 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 important thing is we have these private keys at public addresses, and we don't have to be tied to Ethereum or a specific chain. As long as we have these addresses, then we can move across chains. And so, what I wanted to hone the point that I wanted to hone on is decentralization reduces platform lock-in, right? It uh, and instead of thinking about platforms, we should think about protocols. And the wallet is a, a, a sort of protocol which doesn't need to be tied in. The platform, and and I mentioned another technology here called IPFS, which is a, uh, which is uh, an I guess an a tangential technology to wallets. It's about decentralized storage. We'll not go into detail there, but I uh, just want to point out that decentralization isn't just through wallets. It's also the the whole thing that makes Web three uh, meaningful. And uh, and for the purposes of our discussion, it's because uh, Web three. Gaming is really about the wallet. It's about the, it's about what's being enabled for game developers. And I think also one of the things we should focus on. So of course, the story of Web3 and and wallets has has started with Bitcoin, right? It's about sending and receiving uh, cryptocurrency. And one thing that has happened throughout the years is, of course, Ethereum came about. Ethereum enabled us to create smart contracts. And what that means is, aside from just sending money to and from each other, we are now able to, to create the code to actually build these primitives. So um, I guess a good analogy here is the, like now we're the ones who are able to define the transactions ourselves. It's not the, it's not the chain anymore that does that for us. So once Solidity came about, uh, the developers really uh, built a lot of technology around it and standards. And one of the token standards that came about was the ERC20 token, which is uh, which is mostly the standard that is used when you hear about tokens nowadays. So we so recently there was the ApeCoin, there are some metaverse tokens like Sandbox and Decentraland, and some other chains like Phantom. So that token standard was the start of uh, I would say decentralized finance. Uh, and of course, we hear about NFTs a lot, something that uh, game developers hear a lot and are a bit uh, are a bit apprehensive about. And uh, that's largely because of the 
So these tokens, uh, they started out as, as non-unique, as non-fungible. And then the, the developers thought about what, what can we do if these tokens are non-fungible non or unique? And that led to, to this explosion of, of new kinds of virtual items and currencies. So this decentralized identity, I would say, led to decentralized finance. And this, this decentralized finance is what led to this explosion of new Web3 games and the current trend i would say is um, a trend called play to earn where people who play these games are now able to earn currency because uh remember that uh, these virtual items these nfts they're also built on cryptocurrency they're built on the same system so now they're tradable for fiat money and and that kind of uh, i guess spurred the imagination of all of these developers and all of these people uh, building games so during the um a few months ago, last year, uh, one of the biggest games, Axie Infinity, actually reached a huge uh, market cap capitalization, even larger than Take Two, and almost as big as EA at twenty nine billion dollars. So it's crazy. It's a, it's 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 a reimagining of the models that we have been used to. Uh, previously, the model really was around um, around how we monetize these games by ads and in the purchases, right? But now that the, we have the tools to create these uh, financial primitives ourselves, and people are really being playful with them and really experimenting with the with how we can build games with finance. And and yeah, and I guess as I'm talking through that, I'm reminded of uh, one. One good way to think about it is that Web2 was the internet of data. It was all about controlling attention, controlling the data to be able to get that attention. And now Web3 is the, the internet of money. Now that we have uh, the tools to move money, to define even what money is, then, then it kind of changes the economic models that we know. And, and I guess by moving a little bit back on Web2 again, uh, I mentioned that Web2 shaped the games we make. Um, when when I was building games, uh, I, I kind of saw the language of game developers change from from before to when Web two and the, the attention economy came about. Right? It was a uh, a lot of the games before were around narrative, I would say, and then when Web two came about, uh, the, our language of game design was influenced by uh, by marketing. Honestly, like it's we all now talk about the funnels, the pyramids. Um, we talk about game loops, core loops that make sure that people keep playing the game because the goal for a Web2 game is uh, we need to retain them. People need to keep playing the game. Uh, a mantra that I always hear from game developers is retention leads to monetization. And that's because the, the more the more that people play your game, uh, the higher the chances they'll pay. And this was, uh, uh, this was the driving game design, right? People would want to keep players as engaged as long as possible. So they're able to keep them engaged as long as possible and get as many players as possible. So we're able to monetize them via in ads, in in game ads and uh, in app purchases. So the, so yeah, so, so Web2 has colored the, the, the kind of games that we were making. And, and I feel this is something we should take note of in Web3. Uh, we now have the tools, as I mentioned, to create uh, new economic models. And one thing, one aphorism I, I always uh, talk about is instead of creating games to make money, why don't we shift it a little bit? Let's think of creating money to make games because we, we are now able to, right? And we've seen some games able to do so. And yeah, and, uh, and and that's what Web3 is. I guess very simply, it's explore what it is to build games around the wallet. Um, but uh, as I said, it's a very, very deep rabbit hole of, of decentralization. And to get started, I suggest a few things to, to be able to get your feet wet and try to understand what it is. And first is to learn from the successful Web3 games and projects. Uh, I mentioned Axie Infinity earlier. It's one of the most successful Web3 projects that has reached massive uh, massive valuation and massive adoption. Um, but there are other ones that uh, are worth taking a look at. There's a lot of innovation happening in Web3. Uh, of course, CryptoKitties is one of the earliest games. It was the, the game that was the inspiration for Axie Infinity. Uh, Skyweaver is another great game to take a look at. Um, it's a CCG game that's uh, that's very Web3 and is uh, partially open source. So there's a lot to learn from, from it as well. 
um, aside from games, I engage people to take a look at some of the successful products as well and apps. Of course, uh, if you've been looking at crypto, Board Ape Yacht Club and ApeCoin are one of the, the biggest properties. There's lots to learn on how they did that. I, I feel like Board Ape is the model now for a lot of people building Web3 apps. So uh, take a look at what's there and take a look at uh, the things that they did successfully. And the the one app or project that I particularly like is Loot Project. It's it's very very experimental. It's a uh, it's imagine building Dungeons and Dragons on Web three and what that means. So, so I, I don't think a lot of us know what that means yet. It's about uh, collaborative world building and uh, and all built on blockchain. So it's it's very very experimental, very very interesting. And I feel like this will be what what people will be looking at as they build new games in Web three. Uh, the next thing is we should understand the technology stack and primitives. Um, I would say Web3 isn't really that hard to understand if you are a web developer already. Um, there's this great article, and I shared it here in bit, bit.ly slash Web3 dash architecture, which shows what are the differences from a Web2 architecture versus a Web3 architecture. And, and yeah, just go through that and try to understand these different bits and pieces. And if you want to get hands on on developing a Web3 game, I suggest uh, using this, uh, this uh, stack called Scaffold ETH. It's uh, it's built by Austin Griffith and is one of the the easiest ways to get into uh, building a Web3 app. So take a look at speedrunethereum.com. And uh, I also have a link here, bit.ly slash scaffold ETH Austin, which uh, leads to this video of him talking you through how to how to build a game using scaffold ETH. And the third one is to connect with other builders. Um, I think, uh, of course, this conference is a good space to do it. Uh, and uh, some other good spaces to do it is, of course, hackathons. Uh, some of the good ones are Game Dev JS Jam, which is happening soon, um, and has traditionally had a decentralized category. So uh, if you join there and, and, and build Web3 games with other builders, and then that's a good way to learn. Uh, I would say also, even if you don't know a lot about Web3 yet, and most of your skills are on Web2, there's there's a dearth of uh, of skills that of people that are building of, on Web3 that have that experience. So uh, it's going to be very very beneficial to 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 the team building. So ETH Global is another uh, hackathon that I particularly like. And another way to connect with other builders is to, to join Twitter, go on Twitter. Uh, a lot of the people who are building deeply on Web3 are there. And this is another link uh, of a tweet from Will Robinson that lists all of the Web3 people you should follow. So it's here on bit.ly slash Web3 dash game dash folks. And yeah, and some final words uh, on and how you should think about building games in Web3. Um, I think one thing we can follow is, or one thing we can think about is to, to think of these three words when we're building on Web3. Because I think when, when someone is building a game on Web3, they should focus on its strengths and not try to build on on old games and, and just try to shoehorn Web3 or wallets into it, right? So, so this is a great quote, or this is a great tweet by Alex from, uh, who, who has been an Ethereum builder for quite a while. And he says what he thinks blockchain games should be doing or Web3 games. And I think it still holds true, even though he made it, he made this tweet four years ago already. And he says that uh, well, what he wants from blockchain games is to number one, be a good game first. Number two, explore what makes blockchain unique. Number three, design around the limitations. Number four, persistent and always on world. Number five, player, players own the game, the items and experiences. Number six, allow anyone to design and improve the game. And lastly, embrace bots. So it's very different from the kinds of games that we've been making. And uh, I'll touch a little bit on these, on, on the last three, uh, last, last three Cs of Web3 gaming. So the, the, the first one is composability. So uh, Alex mentioned that uh, the game should be, you should allow anyone to design and improve the game. And that's, I think, is one of the strengths of Web3 is that uh, a lot of the work that we're building is is designed to be composable and it's designed to, and it's designed open source and that's the reason why we were able to decentralize finance because we had this token standard as i mentioned which led to nfts which led to 
a lot of these other NFT marketplaces and the token standard led to other financial primitives as well. So we should think about our games in the same way. We should think about trying to build them up together um, because of course, this is also a new platform. We need to build on each other's work similar to what's been done in open source in the modern web. So uh, I feel that's how we should be looking at Web3 games. Think of how you can break down your Web3 game and think of reusing the, top, the stuff that is already there. Another is, uh, so we have composability. The second C is currency. And that's one thing we should focus on as well, is that, uh, as I mentioned, the Web3 is about the, the internet of money. We now have the tools to, to make our old money. We now have our, the tools to define the financial primitives and the economic models that we want. So this has traditionally been done by platforms. For example, the, the Steam community market has uh, its own trading card market where you can buy and sell these, uh, these cards. Now we can actually make these markets uh, the way that we want to. We have the tools to create something called liquidity pools, which, which uh, allows us to even create our own currency and have them trade up the exchangeable for these virtual items. So I have a link here at observablehu.com slash at polats. And that's where uh, I kind of uh, shared some code on how to do this and also kind of explained some of the concepts around currency. So that game developers have, a, I guess, a, a more gentle way of going from game development to, to thinking about finance. And, and yeah, and lastly, uh, the final C of Web3, I feel, is community. A lot of these projects, like uh, like I mentioned, Board Ape Yacht Club um, and the Root Project, what really makes them strong is the community. It's a community of builders co-creating the game with them. It's a community of builders also who, who feel tied to the lore to the, of their game and are building fun, pro fun projects out of it, building... Uh, uh, co-creating the game even by suggesting game design. So uh, I think that's something that Web3 games should really lean on is how can we engage our community to be co-creators? They can design the games themselves, create content around it. Now that we have the financial primitives to also incentivize them to do so, then we can explore doing that. For example, uh, what if uh, when someone creates a new level for your game, you reward them with tokens, or you can make, make a system where the creating of assets is the game itself. So it's it, it's all very experimental. It's all very, very, very new. We were now creating new genres. And I think that's really what we should be exploring in Web3. And yeah, and and that's it. Hopefully that was a good introduction into Web3. I understand it was a very whirlwind introduction on a lot of concepts, but uh, if you want to know more, go to docs.opgames.org. Of course, reach out to me on, on Twitter, at Polats. And, uh, and yeah, I'd be happy to engage. I think a lot of game developers and web developers need to see what's happening in Web3 because uh, it's going to change how we create our, our games, create our web products as well. And, uh, and we should try to understand what's happening and write the rules ourselves before it centralizes again, like how it happened in Web2.